2. Disclosing Being and the Grounding of Ontical Truth We comport ourselves toward entities as entities. From one point of view, the whole question is what that means and how it is possible. Heidegger calls such comportments ontical comport comportments because they have to do with entities. This is to distinguish them from ontological comportments, which have to do rather with being. Disclosing being is an ontological comportment. Discovering entities is the corresponding term for ontical comportments. What we want to see is how disclosure makes discovery possible. Discovery, which is another one of Heidegger's uh, character, or his, his special words, discovery presupposes a species of truth, what we can call ontical truth, truth regarding entities, which is the only sort of truth most of us ever consider. This is implied in the pivotal qualifier as entities. It means that ontical comportments must undertake to get the entities in some sense right. The feasibility and requirement of ontical truth is what distinguishes human ontical comportments from the behavior of animals and inanimate things. Thus, in wanting to see how disclosure makes discovery possible, we want to see how it makes ontical truth possible. I will call this issue the grounding of ontical truth, and I will structure my exposition of Heidegger's transcendental philosophy as a three-stage response to it. That is, a three-stage grounding of ontical truth. Okay, so now he's, we're, talking, we're dealing with disclosedness and discovering of entities. There's the, the, disclosing the being uh, of... Let's see here. He puts it... Disclosing being is an ontological comportment. Discovering entities is the corresponding term for ontical comportments. So you have the ontological with disclosedness, and you have ontical comportment with, uh, with discoveredness or discovery, and the first deals with the being of entities, the other one deals with being with entities themselves. Um, and he says that... Uh, Discovery presupposes ontical truth, and that means that uh, in order to, the kind of truth is that is involved here in um, in understanding entities as entities, it means that we have to sort of have this commitment uh, to get things right, okay, to. Um, Comport that ontical comportments must undertake to get the entities in some sense right. Okay, so what does that mean, and what is he talking about? In what we want to understand here is ontical uh, truth, which has to do with entities and uh, their discoveredness. The first stage, the remainder of this section, spells out in more detail why discovery of entities presupposes disclosure of their being. In doing so, it shows also, though only in a preliminary way, how discoveries are beholden to the entities they discover, the feasibility of ontical truth. Stage 2, section 3, shows how disclosing of being it's, is inseparable from self-disclosure, and thereby shows also, though again only in a preliminary way, how ontical truth is binding on Dasein. The requirement of it. Finally, the third and deepest stage in the grounding, sections four and five, will reveal why and how all of this depends on the so-called existentialist elements in being and time, especially the doctrine of death. In particular, it will fill in what is missing from the first two stages, in virtue of which they are each only preliminary. It must be conceded that Heidegger himself does not lay out the stages in quite this way, or develop any of them quite fully. But he does say more as the stages get deeper and more difficult, and is particularly fulsome at stage 3. In Heidegger's analysis, 
in Heidegger's analysis, um, discovery and disclosure each have three moments, understanding, telling, and so finding this. It's a tough, interesting word uh, that ha Hoglin has, is a translation of uh, Befindlichkeit. The fact, uh, the fact that they each have this same structure evinces the fact that they are closely related phenomena. That's discovery and disclosedness. Indeed, we could as well say, though Heidegger does not, that discovery just is ontical disclosure. Heidegger's basic conception of understanding is competence or know-how. Thus, everyday ontical understanding is knowing how to use, manage, or otherwise cope with everyday entities and situations. For instance, understanding hammers is knowing how to hammer with them. Understanding a language is knowing how to converse in it. Understanding people is knowing how to interact and get along with them, and so on. Even everyday self-understanding is characterized as one's ability to be at who, uh, who one is. So even he says even everyday self-understanding is characterized as one's ability to be who one is. That is to carry out one's various personal, social, and professional roles. This is not to deny that there can also be theoretical or intellectual understanding, but these are seen as dependent upon practical understanding in at least two ways. First, as many have pointed out, theoretical understanding is almost always derivative, perhaps via several intermediaries, from prior pre-theoretical understandings themselves rooted in practical mastery and difficulties. And second, even grasping a theory itself involves technical mastery of various formalisms, methods, vocabulary, models, and such. Okay. Telling is my translation of rede, or a word which usually just means talk in German. But Heidegger introduces re rede as the foundation of language, and then explicitly defines it as the articulation of intelligibility, where articulate carries its original con connotations of joints and separations between things. Now, tell comes from the same root as talk, and often means much the same, as in telling others about something, telling them what to do, telling a story and the like. But it also has other uses that have to do more with distinguishing, identifying, and even counting, such as telling apart, telling whether, telling what's what, telling one when you see one, telling how many, and so on. These latter senses clearly echo the image of articulation and are plausibly prerequisite to the possibility of putting things into words. So, for example, in skillfully hammering, I can tell whether I am swinging hard enough, whether the nail is going in straight, or whether the board is splitting. And these distinctions articulate what, in knowing how to hammer, I understand. And they also underlie my ability to talk sensibly about hammering, at least insofar as I know what I'm talking about. 3. So finding this, uh, which is also, which is a translation of Befindlichkeit, is another, uh, the, 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 the translation that is used in the English uh, addition of being in time is attunement. Um, so, so finding this or attunement is my contrived rendition of Heidegger's con uh, contrived word, Befindlichkeit. This bizarre term names the feature of human life that it is always responsive to what matters in its current concrete situation. It finds the situation as thus mattering to it. For instance, if I am absorbed in hammering, I will be responsive to the heft and recoil of the hammer, the fit and integrity of the boards, the position and angle of the nail. These all matter to the hammering. But I'm likely to be oblivious of the sawdust on the floor 
or the flicker of the lamp, unless, of course, they interfere with the work. Moods, <coughs> moods are Heidegger's favorite example of a response to what matters in a situation, at least in part because they are so pervasive, intrusive, and uninvited. A mood makes manifest not only, one, how things are going here and now, but also, two, the way in which this matters. Uh, and three, the extent to which it just has to be accepted or put up with. But I think that so finding this must also include more than Heidegger explicitly mentions, such as the fluid, involved rapport of, cra of a craft craftsperson or athlete with the current work or play situation and even the attentive responsiveness that is prerequisite to disinterested observation. <clears throat>